Okay, here we are, Bible study at Lighthouse Fellowship Church, Wednesday night Bible study, 817 North Sugar Street, Salina, Ohio. And want to just welcome you with us, whether live stream or in person. Uh, tonight we are having Sloppy Joes and chips. Bonnie made some Sloppy Joes for us. And we're having the chips and pop and, and cookies. So enjoy, get what you want to. The, we've already had the food blessed. And now just a couple of prayer requests here, several. Um, remember to pray for Gary Cushaw, Carly's friend uh, from high school. Uh, her husband, Gary, is uh, having some problems right now and has been in uh, the hospital for a while. Pray for him. He was in ICU, and I'm not sure if he's still in ICU, but still needs prayer. Then uh, Jane Wiley, uh, for, for her mother, for restored health. She's out of the hospital, doing better. But we still require and would ask for, that is, your prayer. Matthew Pulley, who has cancer, undergoing chemo. He's undergoing some pretty severe chemo, so pray for him. Just a young man. And that's Nancy Harper's son, the one who's putting music on our automatic piano for us. And then Rodney Krause, his shoulder uh, surgery, he had that, and he's recovering pretty well. So we're praising the Lord for that. Keep him in prayer. Uh, pray for Carlene as she's under this new cancer medicine and it's got a lot of side effects and uh, she's having some problems with flu-like symptoms that she's having not the flu it's just got severe stomach problems that comes along with it and so on so just pray for her if you will frank smith cataract surgery he had to have rescheduled apparently uh, and then pray about our sunday school that people would uh, start coming and, and being with us so that we would uh, enjoy fellowship together and learn together and Bonnie's friend, um, from uh, she works at the school with Bonnie uh, in the cafeteria, I think. And her name's Karen, and her husband is, has prostate cancer. And uh, pray for him, if you will. And also Bonnie's daughter-in-law, Susie, is supposed to have hip replacement at the end of January. Keep these requests in mind, if you will, and we'll have a word of prayer right now. Let's go ahead and... Terry, would you ask for prayer about these? Okay. Yes. Praise the Heavenly Father. We just lift up uh, the names of uh, requests for prayer, Lord. We pray, Father, that uh, you would just already be putting your healing hands on these situations. Yes, Lord. Lord, we just thank you that uh, you are always, always there for us. You are our great physician. And, Lord, we just we, we come to you knowing that you're going to... Uh, do miracles here, Lord. It's not if. It is knowing that you are going to be doing miracles, Lord. And we just thank you for praises on um, good health for, for others who have been recuperating and seeing progress, Lord. Those are all miracles, Lord. And that you've, all, you've had your hand in all of this. We just thank you, Lord, that you continue to uh, bless us in this Bible study and use all, all of this for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Terry. And uh, pray for us, uh, me especially, and Carly. And we've had some severe things to handle. But Ben and Pika, my daughter-in-law and my son, had a terrible uh, problem with their pipes bursting, and I had to repair those. Then right after that, the church had uh, some busted pipes in the men's restroom, and it was flooded several rooms and uh, into the hallway. And that was just a real hard thing to do. So pray that I can catch back up on things. Everything's gotten behind personally because of uh, things that had to be done. And now uh, just pray that we, <laughs> that God would bless, that we would get back on top of things. Now, I've got a good thing for you today. Uh, if you look at this, this is, can you can schedule on that, focus on that now if you want to, James. Uh, if you look at this, this is an overview of Galatians, and this, and I would encourage you to use uh, or to look at this on YouTube, the Bible Project. I highly recommend that you look at that, and it makes it very simplistic, and it's cartoonish in such a way. I mean, not really cartoonish; it's sketched out really well, and and it's animated. Yes, yeah, so if you look at this, you will see that there's already 1.9 million views of people looking at this. So I'm pretty impressed with it. Uh, we'll get back on there here, hopefully. And this will just 
give us the overview. Well, we have to restart it again. But uh, we are enjoying Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter 1. And we got down through verse 6, I think. Uh, we went from 1 through 6 in the last Bible study. And our internet connection must be a little weak right now, but we'll get there. Would anybody have anything to share while we are uh, going through this? I do want to mention that uh, we have, uh, we made over $600 uh, for the big sale we had for Christmas. Give the Lord praise for that. Amen. Amen. And then we had uh, the bake sale for Thanksgiving, and we made five fifty one for that. So we are now our building fund is close to two thousand dollars now, which is really good. So hoping to get some things taken care of that we need to get taken care of. I don't know why this is so slow right now. Well, we are going through a few walls <laughs> here, and it's a distance from the router, the motor and the router from that other building to this one, so that might be part of the problem. You may have to give up on this in a minute to get any better. Okay. We'll try it next time. Right now, we're not getting it. Sorry, James. Now you can focus back on our table here. And... James has just come through quite an ordeal. Uh, he was on life, temporary life support, they called it, for several days in ICU at uh, Miami Valley Hospital, wasn't it? Yeah. And so he came through that. God blessed him and uh, was able to get recovery from that. He's still recovering, but James, you're sure looking a whole lot better than you did in the hospital. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, if you will, uh, we'll just follow us along here. And the, a little outline of Galatians here is the first thing is greetings to the church, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And then the problem in the church uh, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 1, 10. So that, that is verses 6 through 10. And then Paul's authority to speak on the issue, he shows that he has authority given to him by, by the Lord Jesus himself. And that's the le verses 11 through... Chapter 2 of 21, the justification by faith is defended. Uh, and so that's chapter 3, 1 through 4, chapter 4, 31. Justification by faith applied in daily life, chapter 5, 1 through 6, 10. So that's, and then closing remarks in chapter 6. So we'll start now back and we'll look at the greeting to the church. And we looked at this last time, 1 through 5. And here, here he's saying, giving a little bit of an example that, that Paul was not an apostle of anybody other than, not by man, but by Jesus Christ. He's talking about Jesus Christ having called him to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And then all of the brethren which were with me unto the churches, he's saying, grace to you, peace from God our Father. This is a salutation where he's saying, hello, and we are, me and the brethren that are with me, are writing to the church, I'm writing to the churches of Galatia, to an area, and this is unusual in the fact that m many times it's going to be to a church, and then it will be distributed from that church, but here he's writing to a group of churches in the, in the area of Galatia, and it's now modern day Turkey. So, he's saying grace, peace, you from God the Father, from the Lord, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. So we think that the world is bad today. You know it was bad then too. And I, I don't think things are getting any better. If anything, they're getting worse. But they were bad then because Christians were being persecuted, prosecuted, and killed in, his, in Paul's day. And so we have to remember that things can get worse, and they have had have been worse and worse in the past. But let's look at this, um, verse five: "To whom be glory forever and ever, Amen." So we need to remember that God is an authority, and through God we can be overcomers, 
And now we're looking at verse 6. And why don't you read some here, Terry? Maybe okay. 1 verse 6 through 10. Yep, we can do that. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel uh, from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be cur accursed. And he continues, as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I know, or do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God, or okay. Christ. Thank you, Terry. Now let's look back at, and I would like to include verse 6 in this too, it, and here's, this is where Paul is beginning to, and here it is, and notice how he starts this out in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So Paul is saying, the word marvel is just another word for that we surprised. I'm astonished that you would be so soon removed from him that called you. So soon removed from the Jesus Christ that saved you. So soon removed from the gospel that we preached unto you that brought you to salvation and gave you the new life in Christ. How, how soon you have been removed from that. And I'm so surprised and, and I'm amazed and astonished that you are. So here's Paul, who's starting this out in verse 6 in, in, a, in a real, real emphatic way. He's saying this is something that is really necessary to address because you, listen, this is pretty tough. You are removed. You've removed yourself, many of you have, from the God of Jesus Christ that's from him not of man he's talking about this is from God this is not of man I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ and to another gospel so here the gospel of Christ is the gospel freely given to every one of us and the problem is is that you've been removed some of you have been removed or been listening to others Talk about another gospel. Now, as we look at this, we see what Terry has just read, which is not another. He said it's really not another gospel that they're teaching you or trying to preach to you. But there's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He's saying it's not another gospel. There's some that are trying to trouble you. Some that are causing problems for you as new Christians. They are perverting the gospel of Christ. So this is not something new that you could just embrace and try to claim to be your own and enlighten you at all. No. What it's doing, it's it's troubling you. It will trouble you. It's, it's, pro, it's a problem. And it's a trouble to you. Because it's perverting the real gospel of Christ. Anybody have anything you want to share about that now? I think there's some things we can say about that. What do you think? Is this the first time that the gospel of Christ has been tried? People have tried to pervert it? It's not the first time, is it? No. Did you know there's many religions that are writing their own Bibles? Mm -hmm. And when they do that, they're, they're interpreting what they want to interpret as God's Word, and they're doing it for their own motivations and their own reasons. They've got reasons mm -hmm. why they leave things out yeah. and they add things to it. And by the way, Revelation rewards us that if we leave, if we take things out of the Bible, add to or take away from it, our name will be taken away from the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lamb's Book of Life is that roster or the book that contains those have, that have given their lives to Jesus Christ, that have been saved. 
And so that's what it's talking about here. And this is a serious thing when people pervert the gospel of Christ. If you'll look at many of the religions today, many of them have written their own Bibles. And I'm not talking about just the NIV, you know, the NIV, the American Standard Code. Those are renditions of, of the true gospel. Yet they put it in simpler language so you can understand it to others. And there have been renditions of the Bible in other languages. Those are good things. But I'm talking about some things that are pretty serious. That where where people would leave important things out of God's Word and add things that are not true. It's a perversion of the real gospel. Terry, you have anything you want to share about that? Well, it's just, you know... When you read this, you can kind of detect the seriousness in Paul's expression and his voice here. So he knows it's a serious problem. I have I read one commentary, and they said it it it's very much like Paul is pretty angry about this situation. He's got a right to be angry because the very gospel that he's giving his life for, the gospel of Jesus Christ that he gave his body and himself for, Christ himself, the gospel is. The gospel, you know, and the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of the Word. The life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is the Word. And then the furtherance of, of what was happening with that gospel is written here in these books that many that Paul had written and others, and that's what we call the New Testament. So Paul has a reason to be upset. He's very upset. And I think he was very aware that this was going on. And then he got to the point where he was actually accusing them as being deserters. That's they were deserting much. the gospel. That's pretty much what it's saying here. Look at verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So here he's saying, if we... Though we or anyone else, even an angel from heaven, preach any other... By the way, are there angels from heaven that have done wrong things, that have done perversions? Who can't tell me one? Satan. Lucifer is an angel from heaven that was pushed out, that, take, that was banned from heaven. He fell from heaven, and Jesus Christ himself said, I saw Satan uh, like an, uh, fall from heaven, like lightning fall from heaven. And he took with him, according to God's word, a third of the angels. Which means those are the demons that Satan uses today. And by the way, Satan is now down here bothering us. And he is the prince and the power of the air. So don't think that Satan's not around. He is. He's the one that will tempt you to do the wrong things. That wants to cause you to not listen to Jesus Christ and not follow what God's plan is for you. So here he, he noticed what he said. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, there are, have been people that have even, God's word says that some would even appear as an angel of light, but they're not God's people. They're not on God's side. Be careful. Or any of us. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So the only gospel we should be reading and understand, trying to understand and following is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That makes sense, doesn't it? Why would we want to listen to anything else? Everything else is, according to Paul's word, perversion. If it's not of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, we, and they should be, let them be accursed. And they will be, according to God's word. Those that would preach or teach another gospel, add to or take away from God's word, they'll be accursed. Verse 9 says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. He says it again. If, you, if anybody preaches any other gospel than that you have received. Now he's admitting here. And he's admonishing them that they have received the true gospel. Now, so this is, we have to get a hold of this because what he's saying, we know you've received the true gospel, but he's making a reference that some of them have removed themselves away from the truths of the true gospel and have begun listening to other people that are perverted. In the teaching, they perverted the real gospel, and they're trying to bother them. 
So, by the way, does anybody want to give me the, the name of a group of people that followed Paul around? I've mentioned this several times. They were Jews, and they were trying to make people try to... Not all, they were okay with them receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they thought they needed to be Jews to follow also the Jewish tradition. If they were Gentiles, they, they wanted these people to take upon themselves the Jewish traditions, be circumcised, all this. So in other words, it's not about just the grace of God. It's about following the traditions of man. And we know Jesus taught other than that, right? Who are these people? Jews. They are Jews, but they're Judaizers, right? They were Jews that were trying to make other people Jewish or try to cause them to embrace the Jewish traditions, even though this was not necessary now. Why isn't it necessary now that we embrace the Jewish traditions as Christians? Why? Because Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't do away with it. He came to fulfill it. And he became the ultimate sacrifice for you and I on the cross. We no longer need those sacrifices now that people used to, to kill the, on the altar uh, and give these, these sacrifices that they were giving in the temples before Jesus came. The priests had to do that because Jesus had not come yet. So that was a way that they exercised their faith and faith believing that Jesus was, the Messiah was going to come. And then uh, now we have Jesus having fulfilled that. So now we don't need to follow the traditions of men or traditions that have now been fulfilled. They've been fulfilled. So now we don't need to do that. Uh, Terry. So I was going to say, so that kind of brings a question here. With all this, you know, you get salvation. Why is it that people would want to distort the gospel? Why would people want to distort the good news? That's a real good question, Terry. Will you want to give us an answer? I got the answer. <laughs> okay, right we'll right ahead. <laughs> it says, when we understand how offensive the true gospel is to the human nature, we better understand why someone would want to pervert it. So it says, first, the gospel offends our pride. Imagine that. It says it tells us we need a Savior that we cannot save ourselves. It gives no credit to us at all for our salvation. It is all the work of Jesus for us. Secondly, the gospel offends our wisdom. You know, who would want to be you know, the smartest man in the world other than Solomon with that? But it saves us by something uh, many consider to be foolish. God becoming man, dying and humiliating a disgraceful death on our, on our behalf. You know, you think, why would somebody go that far with their love just for us to die on our behalf? And then thirdly, the gospel offends our knowledge. It tells us to believe something which goes against scientific knowledge and personal experience. That a dead man, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead in the glorious new body that would never die again. I thought that was really interesting. Here, here, here. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, wow. So again, that was pride, wisdom, and knowledge. What's that? Is there another one? That it was mainly those three, those uh -huh. three particular areas. Well, you, when you think about it, man is always wanting, wanting to try to do something to make himself okay, trying to make himself uh, be approved by God himself. That's why man gets in there and tries to make all these different religions and things, trying to change it up to make it something that we have to work toward. And there's a lot of religion based on works, works, that what we can do to make ourselves look better, what we can do to earn our salvation. But you and I don't have to earn our salvation. Jesus Christ earned it on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. He paid the price, a price that we could not pay for sin that he did not commit, for sin that you and I committed. So he is the one that saves and forgives us. And now... All we need to do is follow Him. Follow Him and He shows us a plan. 
He gives us Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to His purpose. When we love God and live for Him, He will begin to show us His plan for us for living. But that right there does tell about how man wants to get involved and make it His plan rather than God's. Makes sense, doesn't it? So when man gets in there and decides, well, you know, we need to add this to it. We need to include these Jewish traditions. and We need to make it say this or that so that man will have to jump through these hoops to make to earn his salvation. Because it can't be that simple. Well, it is, it is that simple. It wasn't simple for Christ, who died on the cross for you and I, but He did all the work. He died for us. He rose again. And that's where science can't figure this out. How did He rise again? Well... This is something that He did for you and I. He's the one who is the great physician. He's the one that can give life. And so the giver of life took life back upon Himself and rose from the dead, defeated death, hell, and the grave. So yes, this is the gospel. But you can see how people, how man would want to get involved in that. Uh, so so we, we should... Uh, Paul was very upset that man that they were being swayed by, especially by the Judaizers who were trying to get them to become Jews. And so, again, it's because that man just wants to try to do it his way rather than God's way. Go ahead, Terry. Do you want to uh, expand on that? Do you want to go ahead and... Well, it's interesting with, you know... Uh, well, I listened to... I was on the radio today and hearing the radio and there was a gentleman on there that was telling a little bit about his story as he got to know Christ, and that was he was Jewish and he wanted to know more about Jesus. So he met with some rabbis and studied more of the Bible. But in the process, you know, he, he was around a lot of other rabbis, but in the process, they were saying that the Old Testament conflicted with the New Testament and it was changing, you know, the actual. The, the scripture of what really got into the New Testament and the Gospels. So he broke away from those rabbis and studied the Bible himself and found out, you know, that Jesus is the true uh, Savior with that. And he, so he, he broke away with that. He's, he's written quite a few books. You would have to break away from the fact that if you continue to believe that the law and sacrifices caused you to be to be reunited with God, with fellowship with God, then you're wrong. Because Jesus came to fulfill that law. In fact, everything from Genesis up is a, an example and is, an, is showing us, mankind, that there is, there's coming a Messiah. And it's all through the Old Testament that it's, there's coming a Messiah. And the blood is representing the blood that Jesus Christ himself is going to shed for us. The flesh that he shed is representing the animals that were, were given on the altar and the blood. And so all these things are, are showing the coming Christ and how he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. In fact, we just celebrated Christmas, didn't we? Just a few months ago, just a month ago. And when we did, we see that it's all about Jesus Christ fulfilling all of those scriptures. You know, how he would be born in a little known town named Bethlehem. How that would happen. And how he would, it would be a virgin birth. And that is a mind-boggling thing. But it happened. And that wise men would come from the east because they saw his star. People were reading. People had read about this. They knew what the Old Testament said. Many of them did. And they came seeking Christ. The shepherds, we know that the heavens were opened and the shepherds were told what was going to happen and they made their way to Bethlehem. So all these things are prophecies about what Christ was going to be and then Jesus came and fulfilled those prophecies, even the prophecy of dying on the cross and rising from the dead. So now Paul talks about his authority. So he says, but look at verse 10, for, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So he said, he's saying, I'm not here trying to please man telling you these 
things. I'm telling you because I'm trying to please God. God wants me to give you this information. Not man. Nobody has hired him, is what he was saying, to go and give this gospel. God, he's doing this on behalf of God so that people could be saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you just imagine this. He was already, before Jesus got a hold of him, he was already, when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, He at this time, before that, he was already a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was born a Hebrew. He was a he was already a scholar of Gamaliel and, and sat at his feet and learned from the leading philosopher of the day. He was already someone who was very knowledgeable of the law, backwards and forwards. He knew the law. And he was also recognized as a Roman citizen. He was born a Roman citizen. He had position, power, and authority, scholarly, known knew seven different languages. Listen, if there was a man that could have rested on his own laurels, on his own abilities, it would have been Paul, wouldn't it? And if he could have just believed uh, in what Gamaliel was teaching and all these other philosophers of the day and wanted to just trust what man was thinking, he could have done that. But no, God got a hold of him through Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And Paul is speaking about the fact that I'm not living now. And that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm, that's pretty important the way you said that. What do you think about that, James? You want to tell me what you think about that? Yeah. That he, um, the story of Christ, humans have never been story. Right. They the the Jews were hoping he would come as a conquering king, somebody that was with power and might, free them from the Roman Empire, and that they would be first place in the world. Just realistically, that's what they thought was going to happen. That they were going to be, you know, number one. This is all be about the Jewish, uh, all about the Jewish traditions and all about Jewish authority. And all about what they could do, and Christ was going to be their king, is what they were looking at. And Jesus did not do it their way. God didn't do this the way that the Jews wanted it done. No, and many of the Jews therefore rejected Jesus Christ because they wanted a king that was going to be like the kings that we knew about in the world. But for a king to give his life to die for the whole world is what he did. And now everybody that accepts Jesus Christ your Savior. They can have eternal life. But it's completely different than the way man thinks and what man would want to do. Anybody else got anything to share about that? I have a lot of questions. I have something to say about it too. How could these people have studied the Torah and the prophets in yeah, the Old Testament? How could they not know Jesus was the real Messiah? You know, that's a good point, Jane, but I think it goes right back to the fact that Jesus, when he came upon the scene as a, as in his 30s, it was now real close to the time when he would give his life. Uh, these Jewish people that have been studying the Torah, the Old Testament, the writings of, of uh, Moses and all the laws and all these things, these people, uh, they I believe that they were not wanting to see what Christ was trying to do. Because as long as things were the way they were, they had power. They had authority. They were the people, they were the ruling religious people in, in the, of the day, right there, in the, in the Jewish, as far as the Jews were concerned, and the people around them. It was their pride. Pride. Yeah. Pride. They, they would have to relinquish their authority and the way they always did things if they were going to accept Christ. That's why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He knew what a, what a problem it would be if people knew that he was checking Jesus out and 
wanted to know about what Christ was doing and saying. And we, and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus both were men that had come, from what we understand from history, to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And yet they were religious people of the day, religious leaders of the day, wealthy, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. And so it was, it was about, I think, power, relinquishing the power. Anybody else got anything to share about that? Sure. Well, and also they wanted to be known, they wanted to be seen by the public and in man's eyes as, hey, you know, here we are and we're the, the leaders. Like okay, and power, prestige. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also about their uh, recognition, recognition, and they were getting a lot of it. In fact, Jesus, when, when Jesus lived upon the earth and talked with all the, all the people about these religious leaders, how did he refer to them? Was he real flowery in the way that he referred to these religious leaders, these Jewish leaders? What did he say about them? He called them vipers or poisonous snakes. In other words, he was saying, they're poisoning you because what they've got to tell you is wrong. They were not recognizing what Jesus Christ, who he was, and what God was doing through the ages and everything that pointed to Jesus. They wanted, and here's an answer there. They were ignoring the prophecies. They were ignoring the prophecies. But when they were told about when the wise men came and asked uh, the king, King Herod, well, we were coming, we're seeking the three wise men. They were, they were seeking the one, the Messiah that's supposed to be born. We want to know, we've seen it in the star, and we want to know where he's going to be born. Do you remember this? And he had he sent them to the priest, and the priest told them in Bethlehem. They knew, they knew the prophecy, what it said, but they didn't want to connect the dots so that they would need to believe in Jesus Christ. They didn't want to do it. But yet they knew. They knew. And so why were, why were they ignoring what they already knew from God's Word and they were re not willing to relinquish their authority? That's what I believe a lot of it was about. And again, they were their pride and the recognition they received from men they were they wanted to keep all that. Okay, I think that pretty well says it, don't you? Right there. Maybe you have anything to share? Anything else came about? Look at the next verse. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you remember, there was a period, I think it was a period of two years, that Paul did not go and evangelize or anything. He he didn't go and study with the apostles. God revealed to him what the scriptures meant and what he wanted to do and what he was doing. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, that Jesus Christ himself commissioned Paul to go to the Gentile people? And that was going to be his... Who was better qualified than Paul to go and reach Gentile people, people that were other than Jews? When you want somebody that knew a whole lot of different languages... If you're going to reach Gentile people, you know, there's so many languages out there. He was able to do it. And what? And a Roman citizen, which meant he could go anywhere on those Roman roads and people wouldn't mess with him too much. Because when you mess with a Roman citizen, boy, you're in trouble. If you would do anything under Roman law, they had strict law. Crucifixion was one of the forms of death then that was pretty normal. Pretty vicious in Jesus' case. But you did not want... And remember when they when they stoned Paul several times, left for dead, and, and they stoned him, and, and, they, and Paul said, I appeal... Who did he appeal to? Caesar. That meant he was appealing to the Supreme Court of the Roman government. And that meant that he would go to Rome. And by the way, he had always wanted to go to Rome to speak to the people in Rome. To speak to those people that were in high power and in high authority. And he did. And many people were saved in the Roman government through Paul's work. People that were guarding were saved. People that were even... Uh, uh, those... Who was it? Herod Agrippa? That said... Who, I can't remember now. Uh, said that almost, Paul, thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. Look that up. Google it. 
you'll see who it was, almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. So there were so many people that were in authority that he had been able to speak to, which he wouldn't have been able to speak to if he had not appealed unto the Supreme Court of the Roman government. Okay, anybody else? Have anything to share about Jerry? Well, I'm just looking uh, part of verse 11 here. It says, uh, but this, men may have uh, many marvelous uh, things to teach us, but God's revelation has all things which pertain to life and godliness. This is in uh, actually 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, now more than ever the world's the world does not need good advice and wisdom of man. He needs a revelation from God. Amen. Now here that verse is, Acts chapter 26, verse 28. King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Then Agrippa said to Paul, well, Anybody want to look that up? I, my phone shut off here. But anyway. Oh, here it is. You almost, almost, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, or almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. So anyway, that when you look at that, Paul had, he was in touch when he appealed unto Caesar. He was in touch with some people that were in high authority of the day, and that was what his plan was. That's what he wanted to do, but I don't think he wanted to do it or thought that he'd have to do it maybe at the cost of his own execution, but that's what happened. If they were going to execute him, they were going to do it there, in Rome. Because that's, if you were going to appeal to Caesar, and you, the Supreme Court found you guilty there, which they they couldn't, you know, they had enough from the Jewish government to bring him to uh, bring him to justice in the Jewish way. They, they did not, he was the enemy of the Jews, the way they looked at it. Anybody else have anything to share about that? Sherry? So if the revelation of Jesus Christ was where he got his authority, then who was man to say anything other than that? And he, everything he had to say gelled with the Old Testament, with the law, and fulfilled the law, just as Jesus had. Verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Here he's saying, you know, I used to be on the other side. I used to be, as a Jew in the Jews' religion, I was beyond measure, beyond anybody, what anybody would think about doing. He was persecuting the church of God, and he was wasting it. He laid it in waste. Anybody that came that was a Christian around him, that uh, he had the authority to, to have them killed, to have them prosecuted. Verse 14, and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my, many my equals. He's saying he was profiting in the Jewish religion above many of those people that were his age and around him. Nobody was his equal. In mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He said, I know all about these traditions they're trying to teach you. I was steep in it. I was one that was following it. And he was so crazy about the Jewish religion, he was persecuting the church of God, the real church. And Jesus, remember what Jesus said about him? He said he was, well, Paul said, I thought he was, he thought he was doing God a service. And Jesus had words for him. What did he say to him? Saul, Saul, Saul thou persecutest, thou me. You're, do, you're kicking against what? Does anybody know? Well, something of Jesus, sir. He said, Saul, Saul, you, you're, thou persecutest, thou me. You kicketh, you, kicketh, you, you kicketh against the prince. And we're talking about, it's like, some, like a cowboy... Instead of kicking at his horse to make it go faster, kicking at another's fur. Wouldn't that be stupid? Wouldn't it be dumb to kick a spur if you know that's what should be used to cause the, the horse to go forward? And this is what Jesus was saying. You're kicking at something something really sharp. It's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you in the long run. And I think Jesus was referring to the fact that if, Jesus, if he didn't listen to Jesus... 
he would, it was going to hurt him terribly. Probably bring his death. Well, and believing in Jesus brought his death after all. But still, it was for a good reason. So, listen to this. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous. By the way, when he said he was more exceedingly zealous than anybody he knew of in the Jewish nation, that means he was more motivated than anybody he knew of, of the traditions of my father. And he believed in those traditions of his father, the Jewish traditions. Verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, I immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem. Now this is a little bit of history here. Listen to this. So when he knew that God had called him to preach among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He didn't go to some man to find out how he should handle his calling to preach to the heathen, the Gentile people. Nobody. He didn't go to anybody, flesh and blood. He didn't go to them. Verse 17. Neither, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. He didn't go to the apostles to find out what his mission was. Jesus has already told him what his mission was. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then it was three years. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. So after three years of, of conversing with God, Jesus Christ Himself, about what He should be doing, letting God show Him discernment of the Word, explaining the Word to Him, after three years, He went to see to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with Him fifteen days. But, after other, after, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Those are the only apostles He had seen at that point. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, therefore, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. There you go. There's a little bit of history of Paul, Paul was saying, I didn't go to man to find out what I needed to preach. I went right to the source. Jesus himself taught me and showed me and revealed to me what I needed to preach, who I needed to preach to. And after three years, he went to see Jerusalem to see Peter. And Peter had no disagreement with him on this. Peter did not disagree about the fact that he was called and that he had a, an evangelism, an he was to be the evangelist to the Gentile people. And he saw James, the Lord's brother, too. So anybody got anything to share about this or any questions about this? What do you think? Does this all make more sense now about Paul than it did before? What do you think, Jane? You've probably read this many times. Hopefully this will enlighten some of you here about how Paul was called and what he began to do. And so it wasn't man that told him and trained him what to say or do. Now that's not that doesn't mean that you and I as God's men, God's leaders, should should not listen to the writings of, of Paul and the other apostles. Sure, we need to study God's word says we should study to show ourselves approved. Our work with need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God. So we, we need to be studying. We need to be but God had given Paul a special purpose to the Gentile people. And at that time, he didn't know and he didn't realize that he was going to write much of the New Testament. And he did. God had revealed a lot to him, would continue to reveal, reveal a lot. And he would write things that call, would cause our churches to know how to be governed, how to follow the Lord, what was right and wrong in the churches and in our lives. It was amazing what God would do through this man. Terry, you have anything else you want to say about this here? Um, in verse 22, I thought it was kind of interesting where it says, I was, a, I was an unknown person. Well, what had happened there was that there, a lot of the Jews that were persecuted, well, they fled to Judea and Samaria to get away from him. 
And so they, you know, they spread the word that, you know, hey, look out for Paul. Because, you know, he's out there persecuting uh, Christians. And since Paul participated in persecution, his victims would have warned other believers. And then uh, Paul's former zeal in persecuting believers was so well known that many had a difficult time really trusting him. In about, fact, his, about his conversion. There was a little bit of a trust issue when Paul wanted, wanted to make known to the church of the day the one that the twelve apostles, well, the yeah, twelve then because they brought Pentecost was, was one of them now. But there were twelve and he went to them and spoke and said and said something about uh, what his mission was, was supposed to be. Yeah. That he was supposed to be a missionary to the Gentile people. And there was a man that stood up for him among those, those apostles, a man that was in the church that stood up for him. He wasn't an apostle himself, but he was a follower, and he was strong in the church. Does anybody? He was a son of consolation, the Bible calls him. He was, he was a very consoling type person. Who was it? Does anybody know who that man was? Starts with a B. Barnabas. Barnabas, that's right. And Paul would end up going on missionary journeys with Barnabas, and they would be a missionary team. But he spoke up for, for Paul among the other apostles and said, this man has a calling. He, he's not the same man you used to know. Because they were afraid of him. They had reason to be afraid of him. But then, if he was ever going to be known after that, his name was changed to Paul from Saul. And it's good to know here that he has, he had changed. Uh, they didn't know him by face, but they had sure heard about his reputation. They didn't know what he looked like, but they knew about his reputation. So that's what he was saying. His reputation had spread quite a ways. And now what they had heard about Paul was that he had been persecuting the church. But now that same man that was persecuting the church is now preaching the same church that he was prosecuting and persecuting. And what the same church he was trying to destroy. And they glorified God knowing that Paul had changed because of Christ like that. Isn't that wonderful? If ever man was changed by Jesus Christ, Paul was definitely a man that was changed. In fact, he was a man that uh, uh, it was all about God. It was all about God. So anybody else want to say anything about our lesson tonight? It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Exciting about how Paul's life was changed. But it's also sad that he was doing such destruction to the church before the Lord got a hold of him. When you think about how many people, how many people had he destroyed and killed and persecuted, arrested, Put in jail, had put in jail. And back then in the Roman times, many times there were some pretty drastic things that happened to those that were in prison. Remember they would throw them in the lion's den and let the lions destroy them? Not only the ones, the, the men, they would, the whole family. Very vicious times. And they did terrible things. Killed them in gangs too, the gladiator gangs. They killed each other. Let them kill each other. You know? yeah, make, them, make them do that. Let other people do it. Yeah, it's terrible. But now Paul, you can see how hard it would have been for him to forgive himself. But God had to help him. I'm sure. That's why Paul was able to say, this is a new year. But here's what Paul had to say. He said he counted all things but loss except Jesus Christ. All things things in his life that were about anything other than Jesus, he counted it like lost time, lost effort. It was of no use. All the things he used to live for didn't amount to anything. That's what he was saying. And now, he said, this one thing I do. Anybody want to follow, find that in Google? This one thing I do. That, that's right. This one thing I do, KJV. You didn't pick me up, James. This one thing I do, KJV. Here it is. This is 
Listen to what he had to say about it. Pull it up here. Here's what Paul said about his conversion here after his conversion. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. You know, did you ever hear people thinking they have arrived? They, they think they've arrived. The party can't start till they're here. Have you seen people like that? I'm here now. The party can start. Some of them even say it. But Paul said, this one thing I do. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I don't, I, never, I don't think I've arrived. I'm not everything I need to be right now. And I definitely wasn't everything I was before. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he knew that God had a purpose for him. He was pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus, Christ Jesus. So, so he said, I count, I count not, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I did, forget those things which are behind. Listen, if anybody else knew what he needed to do, if anybody else knew how much they needed to forget about themselves, he did. He needed to have God's help to help him forget about all the terrible things he had done and begin to press forward to the mark and the high calling of God in his life about Christ. So does that make sense to you? You and I, you and I have to come to a place where we forget those things and our failures and start moving God's way. All right, let's come to a close. Look at him real quick. Paul used to tell his testimony of his experience with Jesus. Likewise, we should use our testimony for spreading the gospel as well to the non-believers. Because apparently there are a lot of non-believers that believe Paul on how, how his, his testimony was. And our testimony has to be true as well. Yeah, many people believed in Christ because what they, what God had done through through Paul. I mean, it was amazing, wasn't it? Uh, would you dismiss us in prayer, James? Yeah. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with this study from your word and for the church. Please, Father, bless Tony and Terry for bringing us your word. Please, Father, watch over the testimony and really bless everyone in the congregation. Yes. Give us blessings and health. And um, please, Father, put your head on all these um, people that were meant to know the night in prayer. Please, Father, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, James. Now we'll shut that off. And listen, one thing to say. Do you have anything to say, Bonnie? Oh, okay. Uh, one thing I want to mention is some people have said some things about maybe having a Valentine's party. We called it for a sweetheart banquet. For what? Valentine's dinner. A Valentine's dinner, you know, which we would just, I've got tickets made up from the past that we can just revamp those a little bit. And as a fundraiser, and it would be a whole lot easier probably than some of the fake sales we've had. But, but anyway, if you think that you'd like to be a part of that, say something to me, see me about it, give me your ideas, and we'll go from there. Thanks, James.